Ah, recording. Very good. We record these so that we can upload them to our YouTube and so that those people who missed our presentation can uh, view it at their leisure. So welcome again. My name is Katie Breckheimer and I'm the host of Green Drinks. We are doing a series, a special series around the 2045 comprehensive planning process that Henderson County is going through right now. And it's entitled Good Growth Makes Good Sense. And I'm thinking you can see on the screen, my friends here are Savannah Lytle and Tom Fonslow. Savannah is our AmeriCorps staffer at Mountain True and she's gonna be our technical whiz tonight. And then Tom is our speaker, and I'm going to introduce him in just a minute. Uh, but first of all, we usually ask that Savannah just gives you a little update on, on what you need to know about our webinar format. So Savannah? Thanks, Katie. So as Katie said, I'm Savannah Lytle, and I'm serving this year with AmeriCorps at Mountain True. And I'm here for tech support for the night. So I know that most of us have probably spent a good deal of time on Zoom at this point, but in case either the webinar format is new to you um, or just Zoom in general, I want to give you some quick tips. So if you scroll your mouse to the bottom of the screen or you maybe swipe your screen if you're on your phone, you should have a toolbar appear. And um, the menu has some different icons on it. One of them you'll see with the webinar format is the Q&A box. So if you have a question um, that comes up throughout the webinar, if you'll just pop that question in the Q&A box, um, and then Tom should have some time at the end of his presentation to answer them. Um, so when it comes to you, if you just wanna go ahead, you can go ahead and put it in the chat and then we'll go through them. Um, at the end of the presentation. And then with this being a webinar, we can, or you guys can see us, but you guys don't have video or audio on. So don't worry, we can't see you, we can't hear you. Um, and if you have any other questions about how Zoom works, just feel free to drop them in the regular chat and I'll do my best to answer them. And as Katie had mentioned, so everyone is aware, this is being recorded tonight. Um, and it will be posted on the Mountain True and I think also Conserving Carolina YouTube. So in case you missed something or you'd like to go back and rewatch it or share it with someone, um, check out our YouTube and it will be there. So I'll pass it back to you, Katie. Great, thank you. So Green Drinks is sponsored locally by Mountain True and Conserving Carolina the best environmental nonprofits in the whole wide world. Uh, well, Western North Carolina anyway. And please um, join both groups. Uh, I always wanna make a plug. We, uh, we need you, we need your resources to help us pay the rent and keep the lights on. So thank you for that. Uh, we're a chapter of an international movement. Get-togethers like ours happen all over the world. We're one of 500 worldwide. And um, yeah, this is our sixth year of Hendersonville Green Drinks. We took a little bit of time off because we got kind of tired of our virtual presentations. And we were really hoping to have that social element back where we could all get together. But um, I think in-person green drinks may be in our future. Things are looking brighter. Uh, thanks again, everyone. It's a cold March day and it's a good time to stay inside and watch a webinar. So why are we doing this? Why do we think that the current planning process is important? We know that today is bringing us a lot of challenges with growth and demographics and technology and social values, lifestyles. And it's important to look beyond the next budget cycle and look at the long term. What, what does our future have in store for us? We're asking citizens to be proactive and help us shape the upcoming changes to our advantage. And in order to do that, we need to participate. 
and ask for a larger context for our programs and our budgets. What our county government is asking us to do right now with this 2045 comprehensive planning process, they're inviting us to envision the future we want so that they have permission to lead us there. We're just about in the middle of the process and the draft com comprehensive plan is, is, is being crafted. And later this spring and early summer, it's gonna come back to us for more public input. And that'll be our next chance. So do stay tuned uh, and we will keep you informed about when those opportunities arise. The upcoming green drinks, uh, they always fall on the second Thursday of the month. And in April, we have Conserving Carolina's Assistant Director of Programs, Rebecca Robinson, who's gonna speak about trails, greenways, and parks. That should be great. And in May, we have Gray Jernigan and Hartwell Carson, who are gonna report on the state of the river and how land use planning can make or break water quality. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, Tom Fonslow. Tom is a native of East Tennessee. He got his BA from Emory uh, and then went into the Peace Corps and served in West Africa in agricultural education and reforestation. On return, he earned his law degree at the University of Georgia Law School. He started his position at Conserving Carolina as a Project Conserve AmeriCorps staffer in 2004. Currently, as Land Protection direct Director, 15,000 acres have been saved under his leadership. He loves native plants and spends a lot of his spare time planting and transplanting them into various landscapes. Tonight, Tom is gonna to talk to us about the value of conserving open space and farmland. Tom? Hello everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, thanks for that introduction, Katie, I really appreciate it. And uh, this wouldn't be possible without Savannah's help, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so let's get rolling so that uh, we can get to your questions. Uh, I wanna start out though, I, I, we have this wonderful vista we're looking at, and I, I think this uh, is a good example of how the conservancy works. So in the foreground, uh, you're seeing uh, cattle pasture on top of Bear Wallow Mountain which is under our conservation easement. And then in the background, that forested mountain, that's Little Pisgah Mountain, and you can see the aerial on top, that's also under a conservation easement. So Conserving Carolina, we take a lot of pride that we work with landowners, uh, uh, owners of all types of different landscapes, uh, whether it's uh, farmland or forest land or something in between. Now, later on in the presentation, I'm going to touch mainly on farmland. Uh, because that's, uh, we think that's very relevant to the current 24, 2045 comprehensive planning per, uh, uh, process. You're going to see in this presentation uh, wonderful eye candy here at the beginning because the talented uh, communication staff at Conserving Carolina put that together for me and then left it to me to put together the rest of the presentation, uh, which will be a uh, Sergeant Joe Friday, just the facts, ma'am type presentation. That's a reference for those. Uh, younger that to a TV show that was popular in the late 60s, early 1970s called Dragnet. I want to be inclusive of the younger generation. So uh, we'll move on though uh, with our introduction. So he thinks he will. There we go. Uh, you, can you can read this pretty well. Uh, this is our mission, and it's pretty much what you would expect from a uh, land conservancy that cares a lot about the, uh, the places you love. So we want to save the places you love, uh, and that's what this mission is, is talking about. I'm also in this, in this <clears throat> introduction going to make you aware, though, that in, in addition to conserving land, we do a lot to take care of it and to help landowners make good management choices. A uh, little bit about how Conserving Carolina came to be. Uh, it's, we're actually the result of a merger of Carolina Mountain Land Conservancy, which was founded in 1994. You can see that. That's where I started in 2004, was at, it was at the old CMLC, uh, which operated mainly in Henderson, Transylvania counties. And then Packlet Area Conservancy was in existence then. Uh, we had good relationship with them uh, at the time and, and uh, 
they're over in Polk County. Uh, it made sense though that we could operate more efficiently and do our jobs better by merging. And that's what we did in 2017 to form Conserving Carolina. So we've, to date, we're, we're probably just over, we're over 47,000 acres at this point um, in, that, in that core service area. Here's what that service area looks like. Uh, we do go into South Carolina. We've done a few projects down there. Uh, Packwood Area Conservancy did most of that. We've just, uh, Conserving Carolina has just done a couple of projects in South Carolina at this point. Uh, we don't do much in Jackson or Haywood County. We got one project in Haywood County. We do a little bit into Buncombe County in the Hickory Nut Gorge area. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but up in this area, we lap over into Buncombe County sometimes. And certainly in Rutherford County around uh, Chimney Rock State Park, we have uh, we've worked in that county. So how do we work with landowners? Uh, and I'm really breezing through this. Uh, any one of these top uh, subtopics you see here, conservation easements, land donations, and land purchases could be the, the subject of a uh, fairly long presentation. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about conservation easements today in a, in a casual sort of way, but we conserve land by buying it. Sometimes we buy it full fair market value. That's very rare because seldom can we come up with all the money necessary and we're counting on the landowner to donate some value, which is called a bargain purchase. So that's a type of purchase, it's a bargain purchase. Sometimes landowners just give us land and you'll see a, a farm that was given to us uh, some time ago in a little bit. And then a lot of the work we've done, a lot of that acreage is under what's called a conservation easement. That's where the landowner can, remains the owner. So the conservancy is not taking title to it, but the landowner is transferring important rights, important property rights to the conservancy through something called a conservation easement. Another way of thinking of conservation easement is, is um, they are conservation restrictions. We'll look at conservation easements in just a little bit. Um, this is what you would expect though from a land conservancy. Uh, this is high top mountain, as you can see uh, there at the bottom. Uh, we, we protect a lot of forest land. It's so important for protecting wildlife habitat and water quality. And now that we're talking about climate change, uh, forests are, the key, are an important element. I mean, our, our habits as a society and our need for things is another important way of addressing climate change, but we need our forests to soak up carbon dioxide. This is the farm that was given to us, Ruth Jones Farm. Now, we explored how could we hold on to this farm um, and, and make a good public benefit happen. We're always thinking about how to create a public benefit. Uh, after spending some time on that, uh, where this farm is located on Solomon Jones Road in Transylvania County, um, we didn't find a community partner that's interested in working with us. So we sold the farm with, with conservation restrictions on it. So the farm remains a farm. Um, some of you who have gone out to Pretty Place to take in the view there, there's a chapel there at the YMCA camp called Pretty Place. A lot of weddings take place there. Solomon Jones Road passes right by the scene that you're looking at. And so this is protected forever now. Uh, we certainly part, partner with local units of government. Um, we partnered uh, immediately. We Brevard occurs to me um, on the Bracken Mountain Preserve, and on uh, we're working with them on uh, uh, the the Tannery Park in Brevard, uh, the, the the town of Laurel Park. We partnered on their Rhododendron Lake Park uh, to create some conservation uh, land there as part of a restoration process around the lake. And then of course the park at Flat Rock. We're very proud that we were invited to participate there. And uh, Rebecca Robinson, who you'll meet in a future presentation uh, was instrumental in uh, helping the village of Flat Rock raise money for that acquisition. And she'll talk more about that, I'm sure. Uh, we partner with uh, state and federal government. Uh, we do a lot of partnerships with the state of North Carolina. And so you saw maybe more recently, uh, just over a year ago, we added 700 acres to DuPont State Recreational Forest. Of course, we were there at the birth of what was then called DuPont State Forest uh, back in the late 90s. And we continue to be deeply involved in trying to expand the, uh, the state forest. Federal partnership, the federal partnership, uh, it's not as active 
Uh, our last acquisition there was Big Creek Lodge. Uh, that's at the North Mills Recreation Area. And we bought 80 acres there that was in private ownership. A lot of people thought it was National Forest, but it was an in-holding and uh, an owner was starting to develop it. And we bought it out of bankruptcy when he, uh, when, uh, when he lost it at auction and we were there to pick it up. Uh, we also buy land and then restore it. So I'm gonna spend just a minute on this or maybe a couple of minutes. So the biologist is holding a muskie, a muscalange. That's a native game fish in the French Broad River. Uh, they were always there. We managed to poison the river and kill them off. We extirpated them from the French Broad River. In the late 90s, when water quality improved, Wildlife Resources Commission stocked them and they came back. However, the fish that that biologist is holding was not born in the river. Um, that's the unfortunate result of habitat change in the French Broad River Valley. The fish are not finding the spawning habitat that they need for natural spawning. And so the fish that they're finding in the river, and there are a lot of muskie, but they're all from the hatchery. So if you follow my arrow, this is right off of uh, Butler Bridge Road. Butler Bridge is just at the bottom here. The river is flowing from the top of the photo to the bottom and Butler Bridge Road is right here just off the photo. This is a slough that we have created. We spent over a million dollars on um, buying and then restoring a hundred acre piece of farmland. It was prone to, prone to flooding. It was, not, it was not a successful farming venture. Uh, we bought it, we, we raised grant dollars and we did a restoration to bring back, to restore, as we say, the natural hydrology of the site and to reconnect the property uh, with the French Broad River floodplain, which it was part of. And so this slough, as you can see, it's angled so that it is a slack water area because the current is in the opposite direction from the way the slough runs. The, it was designed so that musty can swim in here there can be emergent vegetation, which will grow above the surface of the water, and they can lay their eggs there. And that's being closely watched by our partners at Wildlife Resources Commission uh, to see what success we're having. We do know that a muskie that was stocked in Rosman, that's 18 river miles away, has turned up in the slough because it, was, it had a tracking device and they, they found it. So that's, it, there's hope that this is uh, attracting muskie, will hold them and that they'll want to spawn here. Uh, a little bit more about that. Um, restoration is a really important part of our work. That's why I'm spending some time on this. And so another great thing about restoration, uh, previous landowners who tried to farm the track put up a levee along the river, right along the river. It's, it's, in some places, it's only four feet high. In some places, it's six feet high. These blue areas mark where we have breached the levee. Now, why is that important? We are sparing downstream landowners uh, from the severity of floodwaters, because now floodwaters can access this property just like it, flooding would have occurred naturally, and that's going to lessen the severity of flooding downstream. Um, other elements you see here, and I know this is hard to read at this scale, uh, we've recreated wetlands in this area. Uh, this orange, this stippled orange pattern, that's pollinator habitat, so it will be maintained in early successional field to produce a lot of wildflowers, pollinators. Um, a lot of this area, though, will be allowed to revert to floodplain forest, and then there's a grassland habitat in here. This series of pools here treats runoff from the very dense Riverstone subdivision uh, uphill, uh, and it's a passive treatment system, so water flows slowly from one pool to the next, and at each stage of the process, uh, contaminants drop out and are uh, cycled out by uh, microbial action and, and through the uh, phyto, what's called phytoremediation from plants that grow in these wetlands. And this is, what the, this is what it looked like when we bought it. So ditched channels, that's what these trees are, the tree lines, ditched channels, um, and uh, no diversity at all on this, on this. It was just like a pool table with the levee intact. And by the way, this is Mud Creek that flows in right here. So we call this our Mouth, mouth of Mud Creek project. Um, it was alluded to earlier about our, our hiking, uh, and, and uh, you're going to learn more about that from Rebecca. Uh, we're very proud of this. 
Uh, you might have seen in the newspaper or heard on, I just heard on public radio, as a matter of fact, on the way in, we just bought 56 acres that fills in this gap right here of a uh, old growth forest. And so this is our bare wallow. Uh, the first photo I showed you on my title slide is a bare wallow in the pasture in the foreground and little Pisgah Mountain in the background. And so here's the Wildcat Rock Trail that comes up. Wildcat Rock Trail, oopsie daisy, went over onto private property. And of course, that's the property that we own now. So we've saved that view. I hope you can get a chance to get out there and uh, enjoy Wildcat Rock Trail this spring that has a very strong wildflower bloom. All right, and then if you're interested in, in hiking and learning about these hiking opportunities we've created, just go to our website, conservingcarolina.org and click on the Get Outside tab. And you can, you can see the different places you can go in our conservation network and the trails we put in. But that, again, that's gonna, that's gonna be the feature of an upcoming presentation. Of course, uh, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say something though about the Acousta Trail, which uh, we have purchased and now leased to Henderson County. So although we, uh, we set up an LLC to actually take legal title to it, but, and that LLC has leased it to the county to, uh, to create the trail. So I know everyone's excited about that, but again, I don't wanna um, steal Rebecca Robinson's thunder. Uh, that will be the subject of her presentation or one of the topics she addresses. Uh, there's a lot going on in trails in our area, um, but this is the, the path of the Acousta Trail going from Hendersonville to Brevard. And we're just a watershed event for us. It, a lot of possibilities have opened up. And then uh, when, when Katie introduced uh, Savannah and, and Katie introduced me, uh, there was a reference made to Project Conserve. It's AmeriCorps Project Conserve. We're very proud to administrate that program. We founded it. And uh, as Katie indicated, I was in the first class at uh, AmeriCorps Project Conserve in 2004 and uh, still going strong. And again, if you, if, if you know someone who might be interested in, in learning about that, this information is on our website, conservingcarolina.org. All right. Earlier, I, I covered those three chief ways that we conserve land, buying property, people donate property to us, and then uh, we accept the conveyance of a conservation easement from landowners who want to retain title to their land, uh, but they want to make sure it's protected forever. So what is a conservation easement? I think this definition is a pretty good one. Um, you can see it there. I think the type is big enough. Uh, it's perpetual protection. It doesn't go away. <clears throat> and, excuse me, the conservancy is under the obligation to defend the conservation easement in perpetuity. And you're gonna understand what that obligation means when I get to a budget because it equates to, it equates to dollars. Uh, I want to address, though, before we, we, we get into the budget of a, of a farmland conservation project, some misunderstandings or some things that are said about conservation easements, uh, particularly in the context of working land. So working forest land or working farmland, those landowners can apply to the county for a deferment of their property taxes. So what that means is it's called the present use value program. So if your present use is forestry or your present use is, is farming, that is, you're going to cut the, 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 the forest to, for timber value to go to the mill, or you're growing crops or livestock for sale, uh, you may and, prob and probably will qualify for enrollment in the present use value program. Your land is appraised as if the highest and best use is forestry or farming and not residential or commercial development, which means it's, 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 it's appraised by the county tax assessor as if, as if it's a lot less valuable. And if your land, if you have a working farm, for example, in Henderson County, you're probably already getting a 90% discount on your property taxes. So if you put a conservation easement on your farm, uh, in the eyes of the county, you're not lowering your, your uh, assessment any lower than it already is. I just wanna make that point because we're gonna talk a little bit about a farmland conservation project and how the county can help that. Uh, it, it certainly is helpful that we have a program in North Carolina that allows farmers to enroll land in the present use value program. Uh, that's how they can afford to keep it. But we'll talk a little bit more about 
how the county can help in just a second. So if you're a farmer in Henderson County or, or anywhere in North Carolina, and um, you, know, you could donate a conservation easement to the conservancy, now, a conservation easement, let's say you have land that's worth $10,000 an acre, good farmland in Mills River, and it's worth $10,000 an acre. And um, if we hire an appraiser to appraise that land uh, and to appraise the value of a conservation easement where you're giving up your development rights, that, that appraiser in Mills River, looking at Mills River real estate, might say that, that, that the conservation easement, which will destroy, that's what it does, it destroys the development value that it might be destroying over 50% of the land value because you can't develop it after the conservation easement is in place. And so a landowner might say, well, I could donate the conservation easement and, and, and some landowners do, or if I'm a farmer, I probably need to be paid some money for the conservation easement because my farm is my retirement plan. So if I'm not going to sell it for development at some point, um, I need to be compensated for the value I'm giving up in a conservation easement. So where does that money come from? In North Carolina, it chiefly comes from these two sources. One is a state source, the North Carolina ADFP, that's Agricultural Development and Farmland Preservation Trust Fund, ADFP. I'm just gonna call it ADFP from here on out. Um, but if you Google it, it will come up and you can see its actual name and you can visit their website. The other source is a federal source. Uh, it's, it's money from the United States Department of Agricultural, uh, Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. And the way these programs work, we apply to ADFP, we get a grant from ADFP, then we go to NRCS and say, look, ADFP put money in this project, don't you wanna put money in this project, NRCS? And uh, it's, it's, in other words, ADFP gives the federal program an incentive to make a grant so that we can get the landowner more money for the conservation easement. Now here's an actual budget. And this is just, this is a rather small easement project, 23 acres uh, in Henderson County. And look, all these, what these numbers mean, if I can sum it up, conservation is not cheap if it's done right. Uh, perpetuity is a long time and we need dollars so that we can prepare, can prepare, can prepare for it. So if you look there at the headings across, there's the money that we asked for from the state, request the state of North Carolina. And then there is, there's my arrow, request the state of North Carolina. There's what the landowner has to donate because even when we apply to these federal and state programs for money, there's still a substantial amount of money that the landowner has to donate. Here's the federal contribution. The feds will only contribute money for the purchase of the easement. And so that's why you only see one number in their column and that's for the easement purchase down here. And then conserving Carolina, we're contributing our time or staff time. Um, sometimes when we work on a project, a landowner will agree to make a gift to the conservancy to defray that cost because it can be substantial. Farmers are never, farmers always tell me they're not in a position to do that. So we, we depend on your support to help make this possible is the only way I can put that. All right, stewardship, what is stewardship? That's the money that the conservancy has to set aside in our stewardship fund. The interest income from that money uh, is intended to defray the cost of our annual monitoring. So in perpetuity, we are pledging to go out to this farm and make sure the terms of the easement are being complied with by the landowner. If we don't do that, then the easement isn't really worth much. Um, so there's a component of this money that is put into the stewardship fund and a component that's put in the legal defense fund because we will go to court if we have to, to defend the conservation easement. We've had to do that once with the farm conservation easement. Um, you see that the state of North Carolina only picks up a small part of that. And the landowner, this farmer, or uh, had to pick up a substantial part of that cost. Uh, that's because the, the state program will only, they, they cap the amount they will contribute for that, for that line item. Um, then you see for the appraisal, the state will not, pay, will not contribute any money for the appraisal. Now the state wants the appraisal to make sure that the taxpayer money is being well spent and that the easement value in our budget is accurate, but the landowner is expected to pay for it. And a conservation easement appraisal 
because of the complexity of the transaction and certain rules regarding a conservation easement uh, appraisal process, it's really expensive. Um, and $6,000 is what it costs to appraise a 23 acre farm conservation easement. Okay, there's a baseline documentation report that is required. We, we cannot do without that, $1,500. The environmental audit is make sure that the farm is not contaminated. We have to have that. It's required by the, the state and federal funders. Obviously, uh, if there's going to be a deed of conservation easement conveyed, there are legal fees and closing costs. And you see there those there. And we're grateful that ADFP will cover those. They, they cover almost all of those in most cases. And so your subtotal there requested in the state of North Carolina, thank heavens, $19,218. But look at the landowner. The landowner in cash is having to come up with $16,000 out of pocket. Um, now, and, we're, and I know some of you, I know what you're, you, you're, you're thinking right now. You're thinking, well, the landowner is going to get paid. And let's get down there to that next slide item. Uh, the state is going to come up with $81,970 in this case. And the feds came up with $163,940. Okay. My comment about that, but the landowner donated ease value to uh, 81,970. So when you look at that total line item down there at the bottom, the landowner is still donating between cash and easement value 90, almost $100,000. Now that's not out of pocket, the out of pocket part's the 16,000. But I have to say that uh, farmers are very concerned when they see a budget like this and they have to really love their land and wanna move forward. Um, we ask a lot of them to pay this money out of pocket. And some of them uh, just don't sense that, just don't feel like they can do it. Uh, it's generally, quite frankly, uh, upper, in, uh, upper level income earners who are able to work with us through this program. Okay, so let's say that um, we didn't apply to those programs for funding. Uh, let's say that we had a farmer who said, I'll just donate the easement 100%. You don't have to apply for funding to pay me for the conservation easement. The farmer's still going to be out um, the cost that you see here, about $32,000 if we don't apply for, for, for funding. Uh, and my point is, and you see it over here on the right, this is why the final comprehensive plan should call for establishment of a county funded conservation fund to support conserving landowners. Uh, we, as county residents, as people who enjoy everything that we see in this county, our, our rural landscapes, you know, we're, we're taking, we're, we're getting something in return from the conservation of these farms and county residents aren't sharing the burden. Uh, Farms are supporting the local economy. I mean, I've laid it out there for you. They provide products we all need. The scenic views of farms up there on Barrel Wallow, other farms that we could name. They're part of the county's cultural roots and uh, they provide other environmental benefits. And people don't realize that when we work with a farmer, we're establishing a lifelong relationship. For example, uh, Buckham County has a fund it's called, they have an agricultural advisory board and they have a land conservation advisory board. And they provide funding to support conservation of private lands in Buncombe County. Now this farm, it's the Brown farm. It's right on the county line. That stream that you see running, that's the county line. It's called Line Branch. This is Henderson County. This is Buncombe County. Even though Buncombe County got the smaller part of the, of the, even though the lion's share of the farm is in Henderson County, Buncombe County still contributed $19,000 so that we could conserve this beautiful farm on the French Broad River. And so they leveraged with their $19,000 investment over $300,000 from ADFP. The landowner donated $313,000 of easement value and the feds kicked in uh, 627,000. And there's a, an environmental benefit here. Because we have a partnership with this landowner now, they agreed to fence cattle out of the French Broad River. They All their cattle were wading into the French Broad River, defecating in the river. Um, it was a water quality issue. 
And that has been remedied because we were able to work in this landowner of a conservation easement and uh, get this farm conserved. And then that introduced them to NRCS. And NRCS has programs to fence cattle out of streams. So it was a win on all fronts. So someone might ask, well, why should the county replace the state as a funding source? First of all, we're not, we're not talking about the, the, the county replacing state dollars. Of course, we still want the state dollars to come in. Proposing that the county supplement, not replace existing government funding so that moderate income earners can afford to conserve their land. Uh, another point, uh, it's here in the second uh, paragraph. When we use the state and federal money, it comes with these strings. We have to use their deed of conservation easement, their template deed. And when you have a farmer who cares a lot about his land or her land, they know their land better than the funding agencies, that's for certain. They would prefer to sit down with the conservancy and hammer out a conservation agreement that makes sense for them. And in the early days of ADFP, we could do that. We can't do that anymore. We have to use their template. So we want to be able to offer conserving landowners, conserving farm landowners, a way to conserve their land without having to use a template that they may not feel comfortable with and to work with us on a custom, customized, tailored agreement for their land. And that's what a county supported fund could, have, could, could make possible because it could help that landowner pick up those transactional costs. Uh, that we looked at just a few slides ago. And so that's that's my final point there. Even if, even if we apply only for those transactional costs from ADFP, we can't escape using the ADFP template. It's a pretty good template. I'm not complaining about it. I'm just saying it would be great to offer landowners another option uh, and we could get some more farmland conserved as a result. Now, and let's see. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Because we have a lot of questions and I, I think whether you're interested or not in farmland, uh, conservation so much, I think you're going to be interested in how we can use existing data to determine which farmland needs to be conserved. Okay, so I'm going to walk you, I'm going to walk everyone through this. So even if you're not wowed by the topic of farmland conservation, I think you're really going to enjoy this next part. But what I'm going to show you are existing tools publicly available to you, to everyone. Uh, we're really fortunate in North Carolina to have this, avail uh, this website that we can access. So go to the search engine of your choice and put in NC Natural Heritage Program. Okay, you see it comes right out. This is a state agency. A lot of people don't know about it, it's a shame. We go to their website and you wanna click on data. Data produces this drop-down menu and you want to click on Data Explorer. And here you see interactive maps of natural heritage resources for North Carolina. Just click on this big map of North Carolina. And here you see find address or place. It's a search box, find address or place. So I'm just going to see, let's see. North Mills River Road, Mills River, North Carolina. So click on that. Okay. So there we are in Mills River. There is a bar, there is a zoom out, zoom in bar right here. So I can do that. Okay. And we're, we're in downtown North Mills River. I'm going to click that off for a second. Here's Highway 280. So when you pull up this base map, 
that, that's what it will take you to. You can see your highways, you can see water, you, there are contour lines, you can see topography. This is pretty useful in and of itself. Now, over here, we call this the table of contents where my uh, arrow is moving around. I'm going to move it down. And the reason why I, I'm walking you through this is uh, so you, you don't have to go through the learning curve that I did to find out where everything is. You would think the parcels, parcel boundaries would be close to the top because people would be really interested in that. It's down here, you click on it. Now you see the parcel lines. This is instructive because it shows you how parcelized Henderson County is, uh, uh, which does make conservation a little bit tougher. But I can go up here to, now this is another tip. If you wanna see where existing conserved, conserved land is in your neighborhood or in your locale, click on managed lands. And then if you click on the plus sign, you get a legend. And so this blue hatch, that's federal land. So that's Pisgah National Forest. If it's outlined in green, it is a conservation easement. And then, you know, you, you see state ownership. So if we went down to DuPont State Forest, that area, you would see this green hatch, et cetera. And then you have this other protection. That's a conservation, usually that's a conservation easement held by the state of North Carolina. Unfortunately, it's almost the same color as the parcel boundaries. So if I go down here and click off parcel boundaries, now the, the pink, the, uh, I guess the lavender outline of state held conservation easements share, show up. So here's federal land. This green up here is a conservation easement that we put on this tract back in the mid 2000s. It's, it's actually held by the federal government though. And then this lavender is a state held, state held conservation easement. We acquired the reason why this is outlined in lavender is we acquired this land with a state grant and transferred it to the federal government. And then this is a state, uh, a state held conservation easement. So by working with these state and federal programs, we were able to conserve these holes in the national forest. But what's that got to do with farmland, which is what we were just talking about? Uh, this is just your entry. I'm just introducing you to this tool. I think you should explore all of it, but we are going to turn back to farmland here. So uh, just draw your attention to this. You can see historic resources. Um, you can play around with this. But the other thing, I, you know, I mentioned NRCS, you, you can click on NRCS soil data. So when people start thinking about how can we create a program in Henderson County to uh, evaluate important soils, for example, that we want to conserve, well, we have these tools already. The reason I'm pointing this out to you, number one is you might want to play this on your own and just learn more about where you live in Henderson County. I would think that people who attend a green drinks meeting would be really interested in a website like this. But number two, this is a tool that Henderson County could use to set up a program to evaluate potential conservation projects that deserve, that merit county funding. And you can look at the detail here. I clicked on something called prime farmland soils and you can see that in Mills River, we have a lot of soils that are worthy of protection. Farmland of unique importance, this, this orange. Well, look at that. Uh, we're, we're just so blessed with the richness of, of really the, the, the bounty of Mother Nature in our area. And uh, soils are key to that. Um, we have a lot of prime farmland. That's what all these, these, these colors are about different types of important farmland soils. And it's, it's really marvelous uh, to understand how lucky we are in Henderson County. And I'm gonna stop sharing this and move back to my presentation. We have a great opportunity in front of us. So moving on from Brown Farm, Hang on a second. I see, I made a mistake, sorry guys. Oh, there it is. We're back. So in summary, 
we recognize it, you recognize it. Farms are important. Preserving farmland, like I've pointed out in these budgets I presented, these are budgets from real projects. They incur costs. And we can go to state and federal programs and they'll cover most of the costs. But if there are costs that those programs won't cover, like I've indicated, the landowner is responsible for them. And a lot of farmers just don't feel that they are in a position to cover costs in the five figure range. That's why this, this bullet point number three is really important. We think the, uh, the comprehensive plan for 2045 should include, and uh, we, I got pretty specific here. We're, we're trying to make this easy. It, it should include or, or call for the establishment of a farmland preservation fund that helps at least one conserving landowner annually. We're not asking to conserve all the land out there. A lot of people accuse us of being very grabby. That's not what, what this is about. This is about setting up criteria to carefully spend taxpayer money to support conservation of farms in Henderson County that meet specified criteria that the county sets up. I took you to that website. And as you can see, there's a lot of information out there to help county leadership uh, come up with those criteria. And folks, uh, if you wanna contact me directly, phone number is here. Uh, one thing that's not on this slide is my extension, which is 204, but you have my email here, tom at conservingcarolina.org. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions. That's great, Tom. Thank you so much. Savannah, what have we got in the Q&A? We have a question from Steve, and Steve is asking, what about forest conservation? So what about forest conservation? Forest conservation is, is very important to conserving Carolina. Um, in terms of the 2045 comprehensive plan, when we look at the, the political reality of, of, of trying to win public support for county funded conservation, um, we think that farmland is the place to start. Uh, one reason being we have a lot of uh, conserved forest land in the county, Dubon State Recreational Forest, Pisgah National Forest, Jimmy Ryan State Park, as well as our nature preserves. Uh, so we, we don't see the farmland as the stopping place though, we see it as the beginning point. A lot of farms do have uh, forest components to them. And so we think that program would help us conserve forest land at the same time. Uh, but We've got to start somewhere. We just think that there will be a broader appeal if we start with farmland. We certainly don't want to ignore forests. All right. Well, Tom got pretty specific um, in asking the county leaders to establish a fund for conserving farmland. It's not a new concept. Uh, county leaders have discussed it before, um, but it, it has never uh, come to fruition. But uh, if, we, if we want it, we need to ask for it and, and we need to press for it. I know recently um, an affordable housing fund was established by our county commissioners. Um, that's a really good move. Um, we need places for people to live where they can afford to live, where uh, we're, we're not just a, a high dollar uh, real estate market. So um, yeah, I, I certainly think that, that uh, this is a reasonable ask and, and uh, there's a lot of support for it, but we all need to say it when we're asked for public input again, uh, that's what we need to do. How about it, Savannah? I think we have another question. Yeah, Carson is asking, do you encounter many farm landowners that are opposed to the easement plan laid out by the government? In other words, how many people ask to work out a personal plan with Conserving Carolina? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I, I think we've been, I think we had good fortune so far that the 
Yeah, let, let, let's deal with Brown Farm for a second. Brown Farm almost didn't happen because to, and I'm not saying that county funding would have in any way replaced state or federal funding there so that we could work with that landowner without going to those sources. Um, that landowner almost didn't work with us because they had suspicions about having to follow a conservation plan that's written by Natural Resources Conservation Service. I think, uh, I think too, uh, so to answer Carson's question, uh, we, we haven't had a landowner who said, nope, I'm, I'm just gonna walk away. But we have had landers ask, do I really have to stick with this template? Because they would have preferred. So, I mean, I, th I think landers have swallowed the, the, the required deed of conservation easement that, that comes with state and federal funding. But there would have been a higher comfort level um, if they could have worked with us directly. I also think it doesn't sell well, though. Um, I mean, once you get your head in the template, a, a farmer can get comfortable with it. But at the, at the outset, like let's say a farmer's on this presentation and hearing about this, not having read that template that farmer might say, oh man, you know, I don't even want to look at that if, if I can't, you know, work out a customized agreement for my farm. I think that's a stumbling block, yeah. We have another question from Sharon and Sharon is asking, do farms have to be actively formed or cleared and Sorry, let me repeat that. Do farms have to be actively farmed or do they just need to be cleared and once farmed? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that is a good question. So if we're going for the state and federal farming, there's gotta be a farm there. Now, everyone knows that every farm we have, just about every farm we have in the county used to be forested at some time in the past. And we also have farms, and you see this all the time that Atlanta, stops taking care of the farm, it gets grown up, uh, it may become forested again, and then someone comes along and decides, you know what, I'm going to start farming this again, and they cut the trees, prepare the ground, and they start farming. Um, there, there was an instance just like that on I-26, I watched it all the time, and I watched that process with great interest. It was a uh, pine plantation, so probably used to be a farm, they planted Virginia pine. This is where um, the um, Ward of Clothing billboard used to be, you know, the, if you know what I'm talking about, um, it's a big field on I-26, it's got billboards at either end. And it's where the blonde lady used to advertise for the Bonworth Ward of Clothing, not World of Clothing, Bonworth, I guess, uh, world's best 9.99 pant, I think was the <laughs> slogan. By the way, that was a landowner's wife. You didn't know that. Um, they, that was a pine forest, and they cleared it very carefully, and uh, they grow soybeans there now. So to answer Sharon's question, we know farmland can cycle back and forth. So the answer is we can do a conservation easement on a forest where the landowner wants to reserve the right to farm it, and that's no problem for the conservancy. If you want the state and federal dollars where we pay the 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 larger sums of money for an easement purchase, there has to be a farm there. It has to be cleared and actively farmed. We do have one more question from Meg and they're asking, are there other federal pro programs that are focused on farmers not selling to developers that intersect with the farm conservation objectives? Yeah, so, you know, so USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, their, their front-facing organization that works directly with, or, or the part of USDA that is the front-facing part, the public-facing part that works with farmers is uh, NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. So what I want to say right away is Natural Resources Conservation Service is nothing if not a big alphabet soup of different grant programs to benefit farmers. I believe though that the only, they have two conservation easement programs. So let me just put it this way. They fall under something called ACEP, ASEP for short, Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, ASEP. And under ASEP, you have 
more alphabet soup, you have ALE and WRE. ALE stands for agricultural land easement. So when we get a grant to conserve brown farm, we apply to ALE. If a farm has wetland resources, uh, and when I say wetland resources, I'm talking about mainly about hydric soils, soils associated with wetlands. And those have, they may have been degraded or they may be intact. That is the wetland may have been drained or the wetland's still there or some of both. Then we can help that landowner apply to NRCS for WRE money to buy a conservation easement. So I believe the only two easement programs that the NRCS offers are the ALE and the WRE, agricultural land easement for a working farm, and then WRE if there is farmland that has wetland resources that may be intact or that need to be restored. Um, just a little factoid to add to WRE. If those wetlands are drained, WRE can provide money to restore wetlands, which is pretty cool. You know, I think we're coming really close to the to the time we need to to stop. Um, but I, I want to thank Tom for his presentation. And and if you have trouble interpreting the the alphabet soup, which is hilarious to me, um, he's got his contact information there. Conserving Carolina is just a fabulous resource. I love that Tom shared. Uh, the way that we can all poke around and look at maps on the on Henderson County. Um, that was a great resource to share. Um, and I, I would say that, that our statistics look good on paper for um, how many how many farmers we have, how many farms we have, how much land in in production we have. But when you when you get down to the to the scenic rural character that we value, the 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 farmland that we want to protect, it if a parcel gets a huge complex of greenhouses put on it, it's not this it's not the same thing. Um, but we we need agribusiness. I understand that we need to feed each other. Uh, it's good to have food production locally. There's so many good things about what we're talking about tonight. And, it's, and it does get complicated, but we're so lucky to have the Conserving Carolina folks here to, to, to help us navigate. So keep in mind when you do weigh in on the comprehensive plan, on the draft plan, when it comes back, what we're asking is that the county establish a conservation fund, put it in their annual budget and set aside money to help us keep some of our land in farming. I think that's the bottom line. So I thank you again for spending a chilly March evening with us for an hour. And thank you, Tom Fonslow and Conserving Carolina, Mountain True and, and, and Savannah. And we will see you on April 14th for Rebecca Robinson talking about trails and, and parks and greenways. Have a good night, everybody.